finally, an intelligent discussion about intelligence. Hi, everyone, and welcome to my channel. My name is Dr. Roy Yozovich, and in this channel, I host the most important, the most interesting, and the most influential people and researcher, researchers from all around the world to discuss science, philosophy, religion, productivity, and even intelligence. And if you are not subscribed, please consider subscribing, hit the bell button, and please be part of this great community. And if you have something to say, write in the comments below, and I will do my best to answer. And today, I'm honored and privileged to have on the show with me, Dr. Russell T. Warren. So I just make, oh, the, now everyone can see. Dr. Russell T. Warren is an associate professor. I wrote it, so I will, uh, I will read it. Uh, uh. Dr. Russell T. Warren is an associate professor of psychology at Utah Valley University, and his new book, In the Know, Debunking 35 Myths About Human Intelligence, just came out, and we are going to discuss his new book. So, Dr. Russell, thank you so much for coming. How, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here, happy to chat with you. Um, this is the biggest time zone difference I've had so far to interview. So I'm glad we found a way to make our schedules sync up. Have you ever been? <laughs> this is nice because now it's 10 p.m. in Israel and we sync up because I did whatever Russell told me to do. <laughs> so uh, have you ever been in Israel? No, I never have. I'm, I'm sorry to say I do want to visit. Um, I, I love history and there's very few parts of the world that have more history than Israel. Uh, you are absolutely right. And we will talk about it. I think we will come back into Israel and the Jews and the Ashkenazi Jews, I think, uh, later on in the discussion. So your book in the know, Debunking 35 Myths Regarding Intelligence is an awesome book. It's a great book. And I must tell you, two years ago, I started writing a book about intelligence, which called Intelligence, The Unpleasant Truth. And if your book was available two years ago, two years ago, I would have never got into start writing my own book. So your book is fascinating. And if you can't read Hebrew, please buy Russell's book. It's a great book. So uh, that being said, let's start. I will start with the hard questions and then I go on to the harder questions, okay? Okay. Okay, so I first came across your name with an interview you have conducted with Stefan Molinox. And okay. this was a great interview. And when I wanted to rewatch this, I realized that his YouTube channel was banned six months ago. And mm -hmm. it was banned from Patreon, from PayPal, from Melchip, from everything. And part of the reasons, according to Wikipedia at least, is that he was extremely obsessed with IQ and race. Now, it's not just Stefan Molinux, Helmut Nyborg said basically the same thing, that he advised his young students not pursue a career in academia since IQ is like a black sheep or something like this. And my question to you is, do you feel any of this? Do you feel hard shoulder or cold shoulder from your peers, from your department, or that they can uh, uh, let you do whatever you want to do? Um. Yes and no. It depends on what level you're talking about. I'm very lucky here at Utah Valley University. I am in a very ideologically diverse department. I'm not in a psychology department. I am in a behavioral science department. And so forcing anthropologists and psychologists and social workers and sociologists and family science scholars to all work together and be one big happy family um, has created a lot of intellectual freedom. There, there's not a lot of pressure in my local department to conform to any one particular idea because our disciplines are by definition disagreeing with each other. And so if we can learn to get along with sociologists and anthropologists, well then the psychologists can learn to get together, like, can learn to get along with one another too. And um, I have a, a department chair who is a differential psychologist himself. He's um, a personality theorist. And so individual differences on a variable or group differences don't scare him at all. He, he does similar work. And so locally, I, I feel very supported. I've had some of my colleagues um, even buy my book when they didn't have to. I would have I would have arranged for them to get a comp copy because they're my friends. Um, 
in a, when you zoom out from my department, the story starts to change. Oh, having said that, please do continue. <laughs> um, I came from educational psychology. Um, and that's how I got sucked into the intelligence world is that I had to take a class called giftedness, intelligence, and creativity. And I discovered, wow, this is an important variable. And I started reading more and, and just, there were too many interesting questions to research, too many interesting things to learn. And I haven't escaped. It's been over 10 years. And, um, when I've talked about intelligence and IQ to my fellow educators, there's a lot more reticence. Oh. They are not as eager to embrace this variable. Um, and, and that's really disappointing because the best predictor of educational success is past educational success. <laughs> the second best is IQ. And they very much ignore one of these most important variables, which is very disappointing to me. Why do you think uh, this is happening? Um, I don't know how it is in Israel, but in the American education system, uh, we're, we're very egalitarian, which is good. Um, I don't want teachers giving up on a child or just deciding in advance that um, we don't need to make this class try very hard. We don't need to set high standards. I, 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 like, I like that component as a parent and as a product of that education system. The downside is when that egalitarianism becomes denial. When we go from, we should work to maximize every child's potential and we should give a good curriculum to every child, when that turns into, well, every child is equal in potential. Now we have a problem. And it's that, that shift from equal opportunity equal um, chances, equal resources to equal potential, and therefore we need to have equal outcomes. That's where we're getting more of a problem because um, the mm -hmm. IQ researchers like me have this annoying way of saying, uh, <laughs> some people are smarter than others. Some are going to learn more, no matter how much we try to, to even that out. And so as a result, um, the education system very much turns its back on this research and on people like me. And, um, and unfortunately, I, I feel like that's detrimental to, to children and, and to the field. That being said, I'm not bitter. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, I, I must tell you because uh, I, I think that I followed a similar path when I started learning intelligence. I was in the middle of writing a book about artificial intelligence. And then I got thinking, wait, artificial intelligence basically wants to imitate human intelligence. So let's write a small chapter about what human intelligence is. And I think that I, I say in, in, in my lectures that I knew what everyone knows, yeah? all the 35 uh, myths that I knew. And I came across a wide and fascinating world. And when and then I started to see that I'm leaning toward one side of this world, like uh, toward uh, Richard Heyer and Charles Murray and uh, Richard Nisbet, and it, it, it is less convincing to me. So I tried. I did my best to read the opposite. So I, I think there is no other opposite book than The Mismeasure of Men. So oh, yes. it's like the best. It, it's like. Uh, the prototype of the opposite books of intelligence, yes? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and partly what, uh, what Gould says, and I hope he, he will come uh, to the show as well, that uh, what you said about your educational system and the reasons that uh, educators in the US try to ignore the IQ is basically your fault. It's not you, Russell, but it's the United States fault because when the IQ test was transformed from the Binet, the French model of Binet that want, just wanted to spot the weak children and help them to the US via Louis Terman, the question became, and I think that Gould phrased it very, very accurately, it's not about to spot a weakness, a, temporary weakness that we can help fixing, it's just to measure a, a, even a genetic trait. 
So mm -hmm. I think that in the history, and I, I'm, I'm sure that, that you are aware of that, the history of you know, the starting off the IQ test in the US started with, yes, IQ is like a stamp. It's like a stamp mm -hmm. for the child for eternity. And this is, I think, what many educators, many, te many teachers and educator, educators are afraid of. Do you uh, agree with me? Uh, broadly, yes. Um, and I, I've done a lot of, of reading and research on Lewis Term, and he's one of the pioneers in my field. I've, I've published um, an article about him. I've edited a special issue of a journal about his work. And I agree with you that he brings us the shift from the Binet thought of where are the struggling kids? Let's find the struggling kids and find them to changing that um, intelligence test to being used to measure everybody, whether they're struggling or not, and especially to identify who Terman called gifted children. Um, the termites. So I agree the termites. With, yes, yes. Most famously is, is termites and his long... Um, let me just say it's like a, it, it was, I think, a group of 150 gifted uh, children that he was he, he just uh, uh, treated as like uh, his own children, and he just followed the uh, the life route throughout many many years. Yeah, he uh, identified uh, the the exact number is 1,528 children okay, with so IQs. I was very very wrong. I'm sorry. Off by a factor of ten. <laughs> Off by a factor of ten. This but uh, all of them had uh, IQ scores of 135 or above, as far as it was measured. And um, yes, they were followed for 74 years with official data collection. And then another group collected health and mortality data longer than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the reasons why Terman revised Binet's test was to because uh, Terman was interested in high ability and very brilliant children, gifted, and he um, needed a test to be able to identify them, not a test to find kids at the other end who are struggling, at the other end of the distribution. So, um, And so in the process, he ends up creating a test that can measure almost everybody. And you're right that a lot of the assumptions for a lot of the researchers until about the 19 mid 1930s is that yes this number is stamped on your forehead it's indelible you can't change it thankfully we've gradually moved away from that but iq still has some of that baggage and people still think that that's what these tests are trying to do and they don't like that and so one of the reasons i wrote the book was to clarify what the test really can and can't say and what common misconceptions out there are, are incorrect. Okay, so let's uh, move to the book. But before, uh, the, uh, I came to know you via a great paper that you wrote in uh, 2018. So let me just uh, share this screen. Uh, I will have uh, just a second. And the title of the article is, uh, what do undergrad uh, what do undergraduate learns about or what do undergraduate oh i'm sorry it will oh what do undergraduates learn about human intelligence and analysis of introductionary psychology textbooks and basically what you're saying in this paper is that if you uh, if you go through very uh, many modern or contemporary psychology textbooks they they miseducate the students regarding IQ, IQ and race, IQ and intelligence, multiple intelligence, Gardner theory, etc. And my question is, if the professionals are miseducated regarding intelligence, what are your expectations from the public? So, in in a way, your latest book is not so surprising. Yeah, and actually, that article is one of the inspirations for the book. Uh, my co-authors and I, we analyzed almost 30 of the most popular English language textbooks being used in intro to psychology in the United States. And we, we had very high standards for what was, what was considered inaccurate. We were extremely conservative because we didn't think it was interesting to find where the authors disagreed with us personally, because 
scientists are always going to have disagreements. It's it's part of the job. And so we took some standards um, published in the mid '90s. Um, one was an official statement from the American Psychological Association. The other was a midstream, a mainstream statement on intelligence. And we said, okay, these are solid enough. They've held up well over the years. They've been out long enough that people can find them. They're not hidden in some obscure journal. And so we compared the books to those standards. And we only considered something wrong if we could point to a passage in one of those statements that directly contradicted what the textbook was saying. And so even by those extremely conservative standards, we still found that three quarters of textbooks contain factual inaccuracies. Regarding intelligence, mainly regarding intelligence. Yeah, we only looked at the sections of the books about intelligence. And um, so for some of the books, they were, they were, um, there weren't a lot correcting one or two sentences could fix that for others. Sometimes it was paragraphs, three, four, five paragraphs in a row of, of just stuff that APA said over 20 years ago is, is wrong. And that was a little disheartening. And so um, that plus some other things, I started compiling a list of common incorrect beliefs about intelligence. And when I saw it was 35 items long, in one way, I wasn't surprised, but in another, I thought, wow, this is going to be more than just a blog post or, or an article. I might need to write a book. You know that and my initial title the for the book, for my book, was Nine Inconvenient Facts or Unpleasant Facts About Intelligence. So I just came into nine. So we need to just think of it. <laughs> This is great. So again, what you are basically saying, listen, the psych uh, psychologists are miseducated and this miseducation flows back to the public. And this is definitely. Uh, and I think that, you know, the second level of, of, of your argument is it is dangerous. Okay. Because mm -hmm. if we are misinformed about something that is so profoundly important in our society, there is a, there, there is a real danger. I would say that, you know, that uh, uh, the, the USA today is divided basically or in part because of intelligence differences between ethnic groups. And it's not just the black versus the white. You can see many, many disparities that if you have like your intelligence glasses, all those inequalities, all, those, all the unfairness just vanish away because everything seems very uh, uh, much clearer. Yes, uh, 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 you agree with me? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I, I feel like the individual differences at the individual level in IQ are more important than the differences in the group level, but yeah, they both matter. Um, where you said that ignoring intelligence can be dangerous. I give the example from the United States in the book of Project 100,000 which was during the Vietnam War, the Department of Defense needed more soldiers. And so overnight, they lowered the minimum IQ. McNamara to... fools, McNamara's idiots. Yes, McNam yeah, McNamara's morons, yeah. They lower overnight the minimum IQ. And the research shows that these men died at triple the rate of other soldiers. They had psychiatric problems at 10 times the rate. Mm -hmm. A lot of people suffered and died because my country's secretary of defense thought that, well, if we just train these men more, they'll be good soldiers. And after the war, those who survive will, will enter the civilian world and they'll be more productive citizens. And, and, and he was wrong. And some of the most vulnerable people in my society were sent to a war zone when they had no business of belonging there at all. By and, the way, uh, because the smart students refused to recruit for the army because they thought that the war was unfair. And I would say that Jordan Peterson made this fact uh, very famous that the US army doesn't conduct anyone with the IQ below 83 or 85 to the army. And he says, basically, this is 10% of the population that yeah. the US, the most 
the biggest uh, men recruiting uh, organization in the US says there are 10% of the population that I have nothing to do with them. There is nothing that I can train them to do no matter what. And this is a very, very disturbing fact that Peterson says both the Democrats know the limit uh, and the conservative ignore. Yeah, and it's it's not a it's not a standard that someone pulled out of thin air and it's not a standard that the military leaders set just so that they could make their lives a little easier. The American military has been testing intelligence of its recruits for over 100 years now in some form or another. And from very, very early on, they they discovered that the men who scored worse on these tests were harder to train. They were they weren't as good soldiers either in peacetime or in battle um, and every time that my country has ignored this and often because you're right sometimes they don't get volunteers when the war is not being fought well um, it's it's always ended in tragedy um, in the civilian world usually it's not life or death um, at stake, but I have seen some people propose, for example, eliminating the bar exam that lawyers have to take in order to practice. Um, and one of the reasons is because on average in my country, Asian Americans have the highest passing rate, followed by white Americans, followed by Hispanic Americans, and then African Americans have the lowest passing rate. And so some people have said, well, there must be something wrong with the test. We need to get rid of it. And I look at that and I say, no, because, um, you know, we are winnowing out incompetent lawyers. And if those people end up um, not serving their clients, well, we could have mistrials. We could have people not getting an adequate defense. We have people losing a lot of money. Society has good reasons to keep tests and, um, and uh, intellectual standards for many jobs. I always say that it's not that the test is not fair, life is not fair and the text and the test reflects life. And this is basically uh, the issue here. Now, mm -hmm. you also wrote a book uh, called Statistics for the Social Sciences. And from my own experience, after two or three years of, of, of lecturing to, to the public about intelligence, oh, statistics, where are the- I oh. just got done teaching that class about an hour ago. So the book's right here within reach. I didn't know you were going to ask. Where are the mat matrusha, matrusha? How do you call them in English? Yes. So yeah, the, the, let me just say, and now from my experience, the most challenging thing to explain is what a statistic for the social science mean regarding intelligence that every law in the humanities is only an aggregate law because in the in the hard sciences in physics gravity always works always you can't say ah oh, you know wow this time it <laughs> it didn't fail huh? this time gravity didn't work you know but gravity must work in fact if gravity doesn't work for a single time you need to dump the old theory but in but in but in the social science there is no such a relationship we, it's much 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 broader so if you can please because i think this is a very weak spot for many people to grasp what is the main or inherent difference between statistics for the social sciences and for the hard sciences of, of course regarding intelligence um the mathematically there's not a lot of difference um it still uses the same numbers we still use averages and things like standard deviations I'll square. what matters more is interpretation and philosophy you're right that in the hard sciences especially chemistry physics computer um, science yeah computer science definitely uh, yeah they don't worry about margins of error and standard errors and, and things like that because for the very reason you said if suddenly gravity doesn't work every even once then we have a problem and, and we need to reevaluate our data and our theories etc uh, in the social sciences 
I like to think of human behavior and human traits as being very complexly determined. With gravity, you can determine the speed that an object will fall or, uh, and, and the, the course in terms of just a small number of variables. Its current speed, whether it's accelerating, its mass, and the distance from other objects. With just about those four things, you can make extraordinarily accurate predictions about where something's going to fall, where it's going to land, how long it's going to take, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Human behavior has a lot more than four causes. Um, what you ate for breakfast this morning could have been determined by how much time you had, whether you went grocery shopping a few days ago, what you're in the mood to eat, um, whether you're on a diet, et cetera, et cetera. We can name a dozen um, possible influences on the, the question of whether you ate breakfast and what you ate. Human behavior is quite a bit more complex than gravity. And I don't think we will ever reach that point where we can make predictions that are correct 100% of the time, the way physicists can. What is the maximum correlation you think possible in the humanities? What is the maximum R square? Point what? It, it depends on your variables. Um, I'll tell you right now, the correlation between my height as measured in centimeters and my height measured in inches is one because it's two measures of the same thing. But the correlation between the verbal and the mathematical SAT scores, or if I, if I remember correctly, is 0.9. So this is a very, very, very high, very for high uh, factor for the humanities, yes? Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, predicting one test score from the test score on another test has limited use. What we're usually more interested in is using one variable to predict important life outcomes like um, like life success, job prestige, whether someone will graduate from college, whether someone's going to reoffend if they're released from prison, et cetera. And those correlations tend to be weaker. So the philosophy in the social sciences mm -hmm. is not establishing ironclad laws because that's probably not possible. It's identifying probabilities. And so, yeah, we talk about a lot of correlations. We make a lot of predictions with in, in intelligence research, but they're probabilistic. And so when my child takes a test in school and it says that he has a high probability of graduating from high school or graduating from college, that probability is not known with 100%. There are exceptions, and, and we have to learn to live with the fact that there are exceptions and to understand that general rules may not apply to a specific person, even if they apply to many people or, or a majority. I, I, I write in, in my book that if you, get, if you give me two, two children, one with an IQ of 90 and the other with one IQ of uh, uh, 110, I can say nothing regarding those two children 30 years from now. But if you give me two classes of children, one with an average IQ of 90 and one with an average IQ of 110, I can say many things with high confidence regarding the average of, this, of these two classes. And again, one thing that I uh, came across many times is the correlation between IQ and divorce because my sister got divorced, my parents got divorced, and you said, yes, there is a correlation between IQ and divorce, and because people with a lower IQ are more probable to be a, a, a in this group of getting divorced. And by the way, this is very, very logical because divorce basically means a bad decision, and it can be bad during the divorce, and it can be bad during the marriage itself. So. I say, listen, there can be a very smart man or a woman who got divorced. Elon Musk, I think, is a great example. But <laughs> on average, there is a tendency of you to get divorced. So I think that this is what you said, the, the probable or the tendency. And again, I think that people that don't, that it's not that they don't uh, can, it's not that 
they can't understand it they don't want to understand it okay oh yeah definitely and i i mentioned offhand in the book a couple places the negative correlation between iq and divorce and i talk with my students about that because you know like in your family some of them have divorce in your families mm -hmm. some of them have been divorced themselves and i say look this correlation and and don't quote me on it. I'm, I'm vaguely remembering. It's it's about negative 0.3. It, it's pretty weak, but it's there. You notice it across samples of tens of thousands of people. You don't notice it being very consistent in one family. 0.3 uh, uh, among tens of thousands, it's, 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 it is valid. It says oh, yeah. something. It yeah, says oh, definitely. something. Okay. okay. Yeah, it says something at the group level. Yes. But I say, you know, think about an individual marriage, what might be things that might lead it to end in divorce, regardless of how smart the people would be. And my students can easily name a dozen different possibilities. There's infidelity, there's money troubles. Um, and, and I point out in the book, sometimes getting divorced might be the smart thing to do, especially in situations of abuse um, and neglect. And, and so that's why the correlation is not as strong as it could be and why it's not a good predictor about whether an individual person will experience divorce. But when you zoom out to the group level, as you said, yes, it's a very um, useful thing to tell us about overall group tendencies, which may or may not mean anything for one particular individual. Okay, so after 26 minutes, we I think we are ready to move to the book itself. So the book okay. is divided into uh, seven sections and mm -hmm. section number one is the nature of intelligence. And in each section you have between five and six chapters. So I my first question and uh, is uh, that IQ is not a real thing. And, and by question and, 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 by, and, and, and by saying this question, I first need to define what real means. So basically an IQ is an approximation of, like Richard Heyer say, of G. It, it, it's a good estimation of G. And G basically says that if you take every cognitive ability that you can think of, there is a correlation bet bet between it and another cognitive ability. So yeah. in a way, all cognitive abilities, no matter what they are, it could be a, like a trivial knowledge or how to multiply two digit numbers or how to spin 3D uh, images in your head, whatever you want, there will be always a correlation between two tests, which means, which this is like the Spearman theory, that there is like a unique single unitary thing, and this one is called G. And this is like yep. the intelligence because I can see, I, I, I know, in, or I'm sure that you know, many people who are extremely well in one thing, but they are not so well in another thing. So my question is to you, is G a real thing? And uh, when and when you finish answer, I will ask you a question from the mismeasure of men. So be prepared. Okay. Yeah, uh, this idea of G, this general ability that helps people respond to or solve any cognitive task, no matter what its appearance is, um, there's very strong evidence that it's real. We use a statistical procedure called factor, factor analysis to identify G. And the what some people don't realize is that, and this includes um, psychologists, factor analysis is not enough to establish the reality of a trait in the human mind. All factor analysis does is identify groups of variables and says, here's a bunch of variables that are so correlated with one another, they're most likely measuring the same thing. But the thing is you can spike a test and ask a whole bunch of questions about the same thing and artificially generate a factor. So I might create my intelligence test, but then I might be a little mischievous and create a subtest where I ask, where I time how long it takes people to bicycle a kilometer. Um, and then I have a different subtest to see how long it takes for them to bicycle two kilometers. 
and they have another test to measure their steering ability on a bicycle and then another test to to measure how um, they can go through an obstacle course and lo and behold i now have a bicycle riding factor on my test wow that doesn't mean that there's a module inside your head for bicycle riding it just means i spiked my test with a bunch of tasks that are all very basically simple. measures the, the same thing exactly and the question is uh russell is is, is the question is russell is uh, when two things are so alike that they became just one thing yeah basically and so so having a factor is not enough you have to show that that factor corresponds to reality and to me the best evidence of that for g is its correlation with biological variables g correlates positively with brain size g correlates with um, thickness, thickness of the cortex yes yeah, thickness of the cortex um, how well organized um, neurites are um, axons and dendrites within the brain it correlates with frontal lobe size it correlates with um with um, white matter um, connectivity and um and it correlates with even myopia people who are more nearsighted on average tend to be smarter and if g were just some statistical quirk or if it were an artificial creation of the test it would correlate with very little if if anything in biology and to me that's very strong evidence um, another strong piece of evidence is the fact that we can't seem to create a test that's cognitive that doesn't produce g psychologists have been trying for over a century to create tests and cognitive tasks that don't create a g factor and and they still do anyway and so to me if g were something fake if it weren't real it wouldn't correlate with biology and it would be really easy to create cognitive tests that don't produce the g factor and that's just not so, what happens so basically richard hire is going to be here next week and what you are saying is rich, yes. rich is great you're gonna have a great chat with him yes he, he he basically got me into this amazing world of intelligence and basically what you are saying is you can uh, uh, read stephen j gold the mismeasure of man and about uh, g and about uh, uh, cyril barrett and about everything but it will convince you just until you read Richard Heyer, The Neuroscience of Intelligence. And then in The Neuroscience of Intelligence, Richard Heyer will show you, like in the P50 th uh, theory or the efficiency theory, that just by uh, doing an fMRI or brain scan, I can, I can deduce your IQ or your G. Therefore, G is something that uh, has a man uh, that manifests in the brain itself, basically. Yeah. And we have disagreements about how to go from that biology to the G idea and then from G to how problems are solved. Um, but th there is a link. And there's some colleagues of mine who say, well, G is just something that brains do. And some healthier, better functioning brains will therefore have higher G and, and less well-functioning brains will have lower G. I have others who believe that it's a biological um, consequence, not a, not a functional consequence. Um, I think there's pieces that are correct about both, um, but we're still, I mean, we only have had live brain scans since the late 1970s. This, this is the equivalent of, of trying to deduce every secret of the universe a generation after the telescope was invented. <laughs> we're, we're still early on in this. We know there's something interesting out there to learn and to, to discover. We're, we're still developing the tools to discover what all those things are. Russell, uh, Russell it's not that just that we are like a one generation after the invention of the telescope, but the, uh, uh, the US government don't or doesn't uh, uh, give grants 
to uh, investigate or to do research in those particular fields because they are not politically correct. So uh, uh, Richard Heyer himself said that there is no grants uh, to uh, do a research about the cognitive uh, differences between men and women, for example. So I think that it, it is even more challenging than the telescope uh, example. Uh, it, it is. Um, on the other hand, I, I'm naive and I feel like the truth will will out eventually. Um, there are some historical analogies I see. I mean, in every historical period, there, there has been opposition to controversial but important research. Um, and I, I, I'm not comparing myself to the, to the experience of Galileo, but there was government opposition and formal opposition. There was government opposition in my country and elsewhere to evolutionary biology research and and but the truth has a way of coming out eventually and some of my colleagues are very creative in how they get the data they need to test theories and advance advanced oh. science. Okay, so uh, I couldn't agree more. So let's move on to the uh, another thing in section one where you say that uh, basically, uh, intelligence is a Western concept that doesn't apply to non-Western. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had Joe Heinrich uh, two, weeks, two weeks ago on, on the show, and he is a student of Jared Diamond, and he basically thinks that intelligence is a Western concept that doesn't apply to non-Western. And Jared Diamond himself in Guns, Germs, and Steel said, I am, it's not that I am more intelligent than the people of Papua New Guinea, I couldn't survive a week in Papua New Guinea. So mm -hmm. are you disagree with Jared Diamond and Joe Heinrich, or you just interpret what they say differently? I disagree with them on some points and I agree on others. Yes, put me in the jungles of Papua New Guinea and I will be dead by nightfall. And if you define intelligence as the ability to survive or thrive in one's environment, then yes, by Papua New Guinean standards, I am extremely stupid. And, and, and I admit this. Um, every culture is going to have a different definition of intelligence or a different list of behaviors that they see as intelligent. And that's fine. There are going to be different behaviors that either in the physical environment or the cultural environment are going to be beneficial in some places and, and detrimental in others. And so I agree with the culturally relativist perspective that you do have to look at the context and you do have to look at what tasks are important to be able to master an environment and what tasks and ideas and knowledge are culturally valued. So it's not a myth. So uh, the Raven matter well, well, ab abstraction is, uh, is irrelevant in Papua New Guinea. We both agree on that, yes? Yes, yes, okay. and, and I don't deny that. What I say in that chapter is we're never going to have cross-cultural agreement about what is intelligent or what behaviors demonstrate intelligence. That's impossible. We can't even get every every scientist in, in a conference to agree on definition about anything. <laughs> and so what I say in that book is let's move from trying to agree on a, a word because these verbal definitions are always going to have some ambiguity. There's always going to be disagreement. Some words are just not going to translate equivalently into some languages. And let's instead talk about the statistical abstraction of G. And that's what I talk about in that chapter. And I draw heavily on an article I published last year in Psychological Bulletin, where my student and I found data from um, 31 developing non-Western countries, the places where if G is Western or if intelligence is Western, that's, that's where we're going to find different differences compared to, to what we see in the West. And um, we found that when we did the factor analysis that on over 95% of the data sets, we found G. 
So, and so that doesn't mean that, oh, you know, the same skills that make you smart in the US make you smart in Papua New Guinea. No, what we're saying is beneath the culturally valued skills, beneath the layer of culture and beneath um, the specific tasks that matter, there is an ability, a global ability that helps people navigate through things. the world. What was that? That help people. I think that uh, it's Linda Gottfusson uh, idea of IQ that IQ help you navigate through the world. Mm -hmm. So basically and if you, and if you are born you in an environment that values formal book learning like I was born into, then that G will help you master those skills. But if you're born into an environment where where folk knowledge, plant and animal identification, um, and, and you know, identifying which, which um, species are poisonous, which ones you can eat, then that G underlying will help you learn those culturally specific skills. And so if intelligence is G, then G is everywhere, but the manifestations and the culturally valued knowledge can be radically different. And that's what makes cross-cultural testing so hard is that um, you have to find tasks that are valued in both cultures, understandable in both cultures, and that people in different cultures can have access to in their past to be able to master. So how can, so, you, how can you examine this in Papua New Guinea, for example? What, so basically what you should do is to rank the people of Papua New Guinea according to their skill. And this is a world that I don't like because I usually say skill is not intelligence because there is another oh, thing. Not. So, so basically what they are skilled in hunting and in uh, identify uh, uh, plants, etc. So yeah. I don't know if this is exactly like intelligence. And then if you rank them according to their ability to do or to learn new stuff in their domain, you will see a correlation with a, a thickness of their, or, or, of their uh, cortex, basically. Yes. But, you didn't, but you didn't measure the cortex. So how did you measure, because I mean, if you only have like the Stanford Binet, so how do, how do you measure intelligence in non-Western countries? Well, we took the data that, that were already existing. We did not go to these countries. And the tasks vary a lot um, for, uh, from data set to data set. We had almost 100 data sets. Um, and they varied from instruments developed in the United States or Europe, translated into the local languages, um, to, to culturally specific custom tasks for uh, design for these groups specifically. Some of them were very bizarre tasks um, by Western standards, but um, when we read these articles that talked about them, clearly there was some sort of cognitive work expected from people answering these. Um, what I'm saying is that you could create a pop one battery of different tasks that are cognitive and valued in that culture that people have been exposed to and different knowledge and then run the factor analysis like we did, and you will get G. And you will be able to rank order Papuans compared to one another based on their G. Um, it, it would take some work and some cross, you know, so, some experience understanding what um, the education is like and, and, and the cultural experiences and what knowledge is important. Um, what my art and what the chapter does not say is that. Um, it does not say that we can just stroll into any country in the world and give an American IQ test to people. You can't do that. Um, to do cross-cultural testing, you have to find knowledge and skills and other cognitive tasks that matter in both cultures. The more different the cultures are, the harder that is. It's really easy to compare Americans and Canadians. Uh, <laughs> We know a lot about each other's cultures. There's not a lot of differences. Um, you know, Frenchmen and, and, and Swiss people. By the okay, way, that, I tried to solve American IQ tests and uh, I couldn't do a single letter or word quiz 
none of them. And I think uh, my English is more than sufficient for many things, and I write in English, but I couldn't answer a single, a single word puzzle. Or oh, and it, it's genuinely, it, it's, it's, genu it's um, generally considered unethical to give people an intelligence in a language that's not their native language. So that doesn't surprise me at all. English also has the quirk, a couple of quirks, but it also has the um, quirk that it is the language with the largest vocabulary. 200,000. What was that? 200,000. I, I, I think it's more than that, uh, especially if you count scientific or technical terms and slang. In but, here, um, we have like 20,000. So it's. Yeah. Really and, and I'm I'm bilingual in Spanish. And um, it, after I had been speaking Spanish for about a year and a half and got some more nuance in my vocabulary, I realized that very frequently you had multiple words translating into one Spanish word. Uh, and very rarely vice versa. You rarely had multiple Spanish words mean one word in English. And so I, I'm not surprised because it's very easy to create an English intelligence test questions that exploit the nuance of the language, that exploit the wide, very wide vocabulary. Um, and if you're not a native English speaker, you might not understand the shades of meaning. And so that doesn't surprise me at all. And that's why cross-cultural testing is hard. But luckily, there are some universals. Every human culture has opposites, like up and down. Every human culture has a word for the sun and a word for the moon. Every human culture understands that water flows downhill. You probably can't create the most sophisticated test based on these facts. Mm -hmm. You could create a pretty good test for children that would be useful in Israel, in Papua New Guinea, and in the United States. But I would not be asking questions about American history to people in these other countries. That, that's grossly inappropriate. So, no, no, of course. But let me give you all, but uh, with your permission, let me offer another explanation. Uh, okay. When I talk about the Flynn effect, yeah, the, the, the fact that the IQ scores tend to go up, and uh, I will go is what Flynn explains. And basically is that uh, due to the influence of the scientific community, we start thinking in abstractions, okay? And this is why we today are much more abstracted than we were like 50, year, 50 years ago. So let me uh, quote uh, Thomas Sowell, His Holiness, yes, in his book, Intellectual and Race. And in this book, he addresses the very question about a uh, cultural difference. So basically he says the following, in a world where the ability to master abstractions is essential in mathematics, science, and other end endeavors, the measurement of that ability is not an arbitrary bias. A culture-free test might be appropriate in a culture-free society, but there are no such societies. So basically what I'm offering is an alternative example or explanation, and I said, yes, this test is culturally biased, but it's mm -hmm. not an arbitrary. And if you are, uh, and if you want to uh, to live in this new world, if you want an internet, so the internet is dominated by the West, by science, by math. So I can agree that those things are uh, are Westerns. Yes, we yes. in object and subject, etc. But those things are the most important one to survive and prosper in our in our uh, global world. Okay. Yes, I, and, and I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, th these tests were created and still are, for the most part, created by Westerners, and, and especially the UK and, and the United States dominate the research in, in intelligence today which has some drawbacks, um, which I recognize. Um, and so you're right, there, there had to be a decision of what to put on these tests. And it is impossible for that to be divorced from culture. No human has ever had 
a culture free thought or behavior. That's just not possible. Culture is not a thin, if I can use some weird English terminology, a thin patina, a thin layer that you can just scrape off to see what you really want to see. I'm an Orthodox Jewish. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is you know exactly what I'm thing. talking about. And, and people um, who who are culturally conspicuous or who are um, cultural minorities in their country are, are very aware of this. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, of course, what's put on the test is influenced by culture. But when we create tests, we create them for a specific population. In my country, um, the commercial tests are created for people born in the United States who speak English as a native language. And so that's, and, and, and the test creators will say, it is inappropriate, it's unethical to use this test for someone else because if they speak Hebrew as a, nat as a native, they're, they're gonna have difficulty with these verbal items. Don't give it to that person. Um, but as long as people belong to the group that the test is designed for, you can make individual comparisons within that group. And in the US, you know, we're one of the most diverse countries in the world. Um, there's a lot of care and effort taken to make sure that among Americans who are born here who speak English, that the tasks are understandable, the instructions are accessible, the knowledge or skills are things that people have almost certainly been exposed to, and anything that is culturally unique information to one subculture, we don't put it on the test. Basically, many, many people think that the uh, diversity or the IQ gap between black and white are mainly due to like uh, cultural questions. But in fact, there is no gap at all in the knowledge question, only in the abstraction, only in the uh, ICT or, or how do you call it? Mm -hmm. ECT, can elementary, elementary, elementary cognitive task, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, with your permission, could uh, I would like to move on to the second uh, measuring intelligence and measuring intelligence is difficult. And I would like you to explain to me, please, the following sentence, that intelligence is the most valid and the most predictive test in the social science. What does it mean? Um, what I'm saying that it's uh, the most valid, most predictive test is that um, intelligence tests have experienced this process of validation. This is a technical um, technical process in, in the world of, of scientific testing. Um, validation is the process of demonstrating that the numbers you get for the test scores, they correspond to people's level of a trait in their mind, and that that trait corresponds to what you you think it is. So in other words, does the IQ score correctly, for the most part, rank order people? And does it correspond to an intelligence in people's head? Validation is tough. Um, you can't do it in one study. It takes a lot of different types of data. It often takes test revision. But intelligence tests have been undergoing this validation process for over 115 years. And we understand intelligence tests and how they function better than any other type of test in psychology. And um, the predictions that they can make are are wider than even uh, they're more expansive and, and there's more predictions than even the the wildest dreams of the early intelligence test creators. Um, and so that's what I mean by predictive. Now, some predictions are going to be better than others. Um, and, and that's OK. None of these predictions are 100 percent ironclad. We, we talked about the probabilities already. Um, but name me another variable in psychology that can predict how long someone stays in school, whether they will die in a car accident, 
how good they will be at their job, their likelihood of developing schizophrenia or diabetes, their likelihood of living independently at age 80 or at age 90, um, how many days they'll need to go to the hospital in an average year. There, there's no other variable it is that amazing. can predict as much. It is amazing. I, I would just want to amazing. refer to Ian Dewey, a famous research, a famous research regarding the Murray IQ test, where uh, people were tested uh, in basically the same IQ test 70 or 80 years apart. And what he found was two things. He uh, basically found many things, but he found that the correlation between the initial test at given at age 10 and the second test given at age, I think, 80 was 0.8 or the correlation was very, it was a very valid test, which means that again, IQ and maybe Louis Thurman was right, is like a, a, a trait that goes with you. It's like your uh, fingerprint, yes? So it goes with you from, the, from age 10 to age 80. And second, he found out that people with higher IQ tend to live more. And this is so, uh, uh, it's like, an, oh, how can it be? Yeah. Because people can die from many things, from cancer. And cancer doesn't filter people according to their intelligence. Oh, yeah. How oh, yeah. can your, it your car gets hit in an intersection on the street. The physics of whether yeah. you live or die doesn't care what your IQ is. I, I wouldn't like an IQ to a fingerprint that's unchanging through the, through life. What's stable is a person's rank order compared to their peers that are their same age. Um, and you can get some minor shuffling in the rank orders. You do get some fluctuation from, from time to time. Um, and, and I talk about that in the book, the, that fluctuations do happen. He himself but, got many people that were, it's not so many people, but people who were, who scored low on, uh, and, and when they were 10 and score higher when there was 80 and, yeah, and, and vice and versa. versa. Okay. Yeah. And, and so that's why I don't like, like the fingerprint analogy very much, but I do like the idea of saying, okay, here's a score. There's going to be some minor shuffling around. But most people are going to be somewhat stable, stable enough that we can make predictions about life outcomes, as you said, decades later, being able to predict in middle childhood whether someone is going to make it to age 80. Um, that's astonishing. And, and then even more astonishing is the fact that that same variable will predict how good you are at your job. And that's what got me sucked into this, this world is that I, I was mind boggled and baffled <laughs> that the same variable could make so many predictions. And, um, and it's true. And there's very few things that intelligence does not correlate with and they tend to be things that are that have no cognitive component things like running speed do you have any simple uh, satisfying explanation for this because i thought about this question for a long time and basically what i came up with is that intelligence in a way is a measure of how well you think and you think with logic and logic is the best guide throughout life so basically this is what th this is the far uh, the farthest that i i go with this puzzle so what is your simple or, or not simple what is your explanation that how can intelligence predict longevity for example or cancer yeah we don't have one definite answer and if you ask me there's probably multiple reasons but I think you're on the right track. My colleague, David Lubinsky, and if you can get him on your show, that, that would be a coup. He's, he's brilliant and has done Can you help? Things. Can you help? See, oh, yeah, I, I can help. It's, it's an intelligent discussion about intelligence. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll, I'll help you out with that. But <laughs> he uh, says that life is an intelligence test. He says that much of what we do in life 
requires cognition, thought, and as you said, logic, reasoning. And he uh, he says that the reason why, for example, um, intelligence negatively correlates with dying in a car accident is not because your car gets hit and somehow your brain emits a magic bubble that cushions you as, course, as, course, as the course. car rolls over. He says, no, um, intelligent people may get into the car and remember more consistently, I need to put on my seatbelt. They may be more cautious drivers. They may take fewer risks. They may speed less. There's probably some other variables mattering. Maybe they earn more money, which helps them buy a safer car. Um, but but um, Lubinsky would say, every time you get in the car, remembering to buckle up your seatbelt and then not take it off is like a one item intelligence test. And do that enough times and eventually you'll have a correlation between IQ and dying in a car accident, a negative correlation. And so his idea is life is an intelligence test. And because so many things in an economically developed country require the use of your intelligence, lo and behold, they end up correlating with IQ, even though the test creators never intended it. So this is uh, and i think that from there we can move uh, do we have like uh, 10 more minutes oh yeah i definitely have more time okay so so because i have a lot of questions because by the way again it's a great book you're the one who has to go to bed soon it's it's no, too no. no it's like the pandemic and i teach just in zoom this is my uh, studio here and it's oh. it's a uh, we are in the quarantine for the second week now and it's going to be uh, extended into another week and uh, it is very, very tough and people don't, know, people don't know what is going to happen. And the government, you know, every, every day changes its mind. So it, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's not a nice uh, time to be, but Man. we hope that now with your uh, new president, uh, <laughs> we, everything will be better. There's, all, there's always hope that the future can be better. That's for sure. Yes, but this is a conservative uh, podcast, so we, it, 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 it will probably won't. Okay, so now, uh, again, uh, one of the things that you love the most is G Martin Gardner multiple intelligent theory. And by the way, uh, it, he, this is not a new theory because we have Robert Steinberg theory and Thunder Dyke theory in the beginning of the 20th century. Just Gardner yes. became immensely famous. And Errol Hunt, the famous author of the book Intelligence, a great book, wrote mm -hmm. that Gardner theory was an easy sell for teachers, an easy oh, yeah. sell. So if you could please, and I, I, I don't know if you wrote uh, uh, Errol Hunt quote, but if you can please explain, A, why Gardner theory is such an easy sell for teachers and many teachers and educators believe in this theory and B, do you find it not just wrong factually, but also dangerous? Because I found Gardner theory dangerous. So uh, please. Yeah, um, first of all, it is, it is wrong factually. Um, and that chapter in my book was one of the easiest to write because all I had to do was quote Gardner and say, yeah, there are hundreds of studies showing this is, incorrect or or to show the problems of his logic and um and show why the theory just just isn't lined up with facts um it's not a kind chapter to howard gardner and if he watches this video it's nothing personal howard um it's just the fact that it, it's you're not lining up with empirical reality in the data um i'm sure you're a nice person i've never met you in in person but sorry it, it's not it's not a kind chapter to gardner um why was it an easy sell i think because it tells people especially americans what they want to hear 
and never underestimate people's willingness to to be flattered or to have their prior beliefs um, bolstered. Um, especially in America, where where we do have this really strong egalitarian bent. And American idea, dream, American yeah. dream. If you walk hard enough, if you not because I think it's crucial. If you walk hard enough, you will eventually uh, uh, prosper. So I think that intelligence, in a way, hurt the weak uh, spot of the American dream because some people, no matter how hard they walk in uh, in uh, in particular in special domains, it doesn't matter. So so yeah, exactly, and and I think Gardner said. Um, said look you know almost everyone's smart in some domain oh you're not good at school well don't worry about the logical mathematical intelligence instead concentrate on your bodily kinesthetic intelligence and be the best dancer you can be by the way god didn't say it god said that there are eight uh, separate uh, 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 orthogonal intelligences but according to garden theory there could be a case where a, a child or a pupil is unskilled in every one of them yes but yes but the interpretation by teachers yes, yeah. is that you everyone is a genius in another in, in yes. a certain field. thank you thank you for that clarification because um, i think it's i i think it's very important because this exactly what to in my opinion makes garden theory so dangerous because in instead of letting the child and, and say listen you are not good in math and if you are willing to do the homework and if you are willing to work out you can uh, we can leverage your skill from I don't know, from three units to five units, I don't know, uh, this is how it goes in Israel. But basically we say, listen, it's not that you are not good in math, you are genius in one other thing. And when you, and when everyone is smart, no one is smart, okay? And I think that this encapsulate because smart is a, a, a something in something in reality and if you eliminate the word smart like in uh, 18 uh, 1984 people will come up with a different world to point yeah. to someone and say is smart and i mm -hmm. think that garner theory tries to un to to just vanish the word smart but again it's something real in reality and we will need the world to point to someone and say he is very smart. I should go to him for an advice. Yeah, and, and I, I see, I, I see the perspective of where it's problematic in practice as being very much um, at the teacher level. Um, I don't want teachers wasting time to try to find eight different ways to teach fractions because <laughs> they think they have to reach each child's intelligence. That that's a waste of their time. Um, I don't want, I don't want schools saying, well, let's value all the intelligences equally the way Gardner says we should, and let's spend the exact same amount of time on athletics and dance as we do on math. Because in a 21st century society, there are going to be far more economic and technological advances from a population that can do math very well than from a population that can dance well. Okay. I mean, that, that's just that's just the reality. Okay, so uh, another question regarding uh, Gardner theory is how do you, uh, uh, there is Gardner theory of multiple intelligence and there is Daniel Goleman theory of emotional intelligence. And basically mm -hmm. what Gardner does is take uh, the notion of intelligence and separate it into eight different aspects and we and we know that at least three of them it's the mathematical the special and the verbal are uh, linked together do, uh, mm -hmm. with the g and goldman basically does the opposite thing he takes two things that they are not correlated like personality and intelligence and combines them into just one a strange thing and i think that hans isaac once said that in psychology we want to separate things and to just look at one specific thing and what gardner and what goldman does is the exact opposite it takes personality which we know 
like the big five, et cetera. And we take, and you take intelligence and you mix them into like an emotional intelligence, which is mm -hmm. neither here nor there. Yeah. And, and there's value in splitting things and looking at different traits individually. Um, I empathize with these other theorists because just like how no one's ever had a culture free thought or action no one's had a personality free thought or action you know we don't solely reason and then solely use our personality and then solely use our emotions these things are happening at once and so i get why they would want to do that but you can't understand how different traits mix or operate at the same time mm -hmm. unless you understand them in isolation first um i'm a little more sympathetic towards the emotional intelligence theory as as you can see in the book it also gets a chapter um i believe goldman's uh biggest problem in the mid 90s when he published his book emotional intelligence was that he um, was overly enthusiastic about it and the data supporting his claims simply wasn't there. And here we are 25 years later, finally saying, okay, here are claims that are definitely wrong. Goldman was definitely wrong that intelligence matters more, that emotional intelligence matters more in the workplace than IQ. He was definitely wrong about that. Um, but there are some places where we say, okay, there's some data supporting some of these ideas. Like one of them is the idea that you want a manager with high emotional intelligence to be your boss. Okay, there's there's value in having a boss who can navigate social situations, social who skills. can perceive, perceive, yeah, social skills, who can perceive distress in people, who can work to help groups work harmonious. Okay that seems to be supported. Um, and so I'm, I'm cautiously realistic in that chapter. Whereas with the Gardner chapter, I say, look, this is wrong from top to bottom. By the and way, I think that many people regard or uh, value emotional intelligence, at least as intelligence, because, uh, and I don't know who wrote it, but I wrote it in the book, you usually, your peers are in the same IQ level uh, as you. So if you're all in the same IQ level, what matters more is the emotional intelligence, your social skills. And then people say, wow, he is smart, but he has a social, he is a big social skills guy. Therefore, he is, it is much more important, but people forget that you look at the very reduced sample with all the people have average the same IQ. So many doctors or many uh, in the hospital where the IQ is probably uh, 135 and more. So the entire sample space is 135. So there is no doubt that the one with a social skill will flourish more. But exactly. But reduce sample size. Yeah. When you look at the whole general population in a big study, Mm -hmm. um then yes iq seems to matter a lot and emotional intelligence mm -hmm. matters much less but you're right people do not mingle with a representative sample of all intelligence levels people tend to balkanize to people who are about as intelligent as they are and i'm in one of those workplaces you mentioned my colleagues here in the behavioral science department at utah valley university are all very very smart people they're very brilliant. Uh, I'll bet you at least half of them have a higher IQ than I do. <laughs> but what matters in our teaching and our writing ends up not being IQ because we're all doing above average and some of them are very, very smart. What ends up mattering more in the teaching is a lot of the soft skills, a lot of the oh. thoughtfulness to reach out to the students who are struggling. Um, having a sense of humor so you can make a, a class and, and then those things those social pieces start looking like they're more important okay in so my workplace just a second you just said i will do it like in the talmud 
you just said that we are all above average, therefore the social skills and in, 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 in the writings matter more. But in another chapter of your book, you said against the measure bar. So that above a certain threshold, above a certain average, it doesn't matter. So uh, I, I would like to even make this question harder with a very famous uh, article published by Nassim Nikola Taleb two years ago, I think, mm. that IQ is largely a pseudoscientific swindle. Basically what Nassim said and Stefan Molino had, I think one, one hour that he just covered the entire article. Basically what he says is that IQ matters most in the extremes. So in uh, below 70 and above, 130 but in the main in the main between 85 between 90 and 110 it doesn't matter so basically it doesn't matter so my question is to you you just said that if, since your peers are all above average what matters most is the uh, uh, is the social or the soft skills mm -hmm. and how does it correlate with Nassim Taleb and the measure bar theory or the measure bar myth yeah, um, it's I mean, it's a very complex question. The reason why within a workplace it appears that other skills matter more than intelligence, and 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 in some workplaces it, it may very well be true, um, especially in very social workplaces. I imagine, for example, a wedding planner needs to have really high yeah definitely. emotional intelligence to be successful you invented the name Brazila, i think it's like an english <laughs> name yes Brazila. <laughs> yes uh yes we have bridezillas over here if everything's not going perfect they they lose it on their wedding day and that wedding planner needs to be able to smooth over those emotional um uh, hiccups um the reason why it's it's nothing special to do with um, intelligence or IQ, why within a specific workplace, it might not matter enough. It's just restriction of range in the data. You see the same thing, for example, in the NBA. Um, everybody in the National Basketball Association League is very tall. They are much taller than I am. I'm 5'7". Um, and almost all these people are eight inches or more taller than me. Um, and so when you look within professional basketball players, the correlation between height and the number of points they score is zero, absolutely zero. And so if you look at just NBA players, you might look at that and say, wow, height doesn't matter much for playing basketball. Well, who gets to the NBA? But okay, but I, 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 I totally agree. But IQ do affect your ability to write scientific papers. So my question is, yeah. to, is when you said that we are all above average, you just said our teaching skills, but you should say, listen, I think that even in my department, although we are all above the average, the, the smarter, the more, uh, uh, the more high IQ people will eventually will produce more scientific papers. Yeah, I'm not saying that the correlation within me and my colleagues goes to zero, but it greatly weakens compared to the general population because my colleagues are all very smart. They went to great elite universities. They all wrote a dissertation, um, but we were not selected on our social skills. And so we have in variation of IQ, there's some, but it's it's much narrower than our wide variation of social skills. And so because our social skills are more variable, it seems within this environment that uh, um, emotional intelligence and social skills might be more important than IQ, even if IQ's importance isn't zero. But if we were to randomly assign people to jobs, and every job in every workplace had a representative sample of, of people from all IQ levels. Okay, we would find I, that correlation I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. But again, the measure bar theory of the measure bar myth says that, uh, or debunking this myth say that if you're a researcher or a scholar with 135 and, you are, and there is another researcher with 150, 
the researcher with 150 will gain or will can exploit or benefit from his extra 15 points in a much, uh, uh, in much better sense than the 135. He will produce yeah. much better scientific paper. I think that Stephen Shu said that I, I see that the IQ uh, is in the physics department, I think. And he said, yes. I, I see that there are much smarter people than me, and they can produce much better work in the world of uh, in the world. And, of and it, it depends on it depends on how restricted your sample is. Um, in just psychology, in my department, I think there's about fifteen of us. Um, you know, there probably is a you know a, a several point gap between the smartest and, and and the least intelligence not that we care not that we're comparing <laughs> but um yet to remember that the further up the scale you go the fewer and fewer people there are so you're right an iq of 150 gives you a huge advantage over someone with an iq of 135 whether you're a surgeon or a college professor but with 15 psychologists in the same department, it's extraordinarily unlikely you're going to find a psychologist with an IQ of, of 150. Uh, the vast majority are going to be between 125 and 135, perhaps all of them. And so, yes, you do see those advantages at very, very high levels, but it takes very large samples and very elite samples. And I talk about those in the book. But most of us aren't in a workplace that has enough people and enough high IQ, elite, intelligent people to to really notice, wow, my IQ is only 125. Here are colleagues at 135, 140, 145, 150. There just aren't as many people. And so that's why we don't notice it in a high IQ workplace. So let's go back to Nassim Taleb. Would you say that in modern nowadays, like modern, not in uh, 10 years ago, but not in 10 years from now, but in modern workplace, there is a difference between 100 and 110 for Definitely. most of Definitely. And most of the data about what IQ correlates with is collected on the people who are closer to average simply because there's more of them. <laughs> They're easier to find it out in the wild. Yeah. Uh, and so 86 people, 86 percent of the population lies between 85 IQ points and 115 IQ points. So 68 percent, 68 percent, 68. Yes. And so if it really were a zero correlation, then uh, in that middle range, um, we wouldn't find in large samples, which consist mostly of people in the middle range, that there are any correlations. It would be driven completely by the outliers. And that's just simply not what happens in, in the data. And, um, you know, when we have tests that don't have as high ceilings or as low floors, they, they truncate the scores. Um, if Taleb were correct, then on those tests, you would find zero correlations with anything else. And that's just simply not what happens. Uh, a good example of those sort of tests are the basic skills tests here in the United States that we give to kids at the end of the school year. They master, they, they test whether a child has mastered the basic curriculum. So we're not asking 10 year olds whether they can do algebra or trigonometry. We're asking 10 year olds, did you master adding fractions? Something that every kid was supposed to be taught. Mm -hmm. And so if you convert that to an IQ score, you don't get numbers above about 120. It, there's just not hard enough questions. And those scores still correlate with, with socioeconomic status. They still correlate with all sorts of other things. If Tala were correct, they would correlate zero. And oh, they don't. so I think that this is a very important distinction that even if the maximum score is 120, you still get, and this is in the vicinity of the of of like a 
the normal people, you still get a significant correlation. And I think that like a, a, a beautiful example is Elon Musk's new battery company. And for decades, batteries like the, uh, the trash of electrical engineering and all the smart people didn't uh, address this, uh, this road because it wasn't interesting enough. And then Elon Musk and got you know, the most, uh, uh, the smartest man on, on the planet. And he like one year, they just transform this field completely. So if a very talented, a very gifted man approaches any field, he will just transform it. And I think that the Elon Musk battery company is a great example because mm -hmm. for decades, batteries remain the same for decades. Mm -hmm. And then oh, yeah. one year and everything now is changing. Yeah. And, and there is research showing, and I actually talk about it in the, the Gardner chapter, there is research showing that people who are eminent in one field have a higher likelihood of making contributions to other fields, even completely unrelated ones. Um, Nobelists are more likely to have, uh, science Nobelists are more likely to have also published in disciplines outside of what they were trained in, even before they won the Nobel and became famous. Wow. Um, and so that that to me says, yes, smarter people are more able to change fields. They're more able to make contributions to fields. Um, and we've seen we've seen the downside with and during this pandemic with people whose intelligence is maybe only modestly above until <laughs> above average try their hand at epidemiology and virology or, or what decisions to make in i actually Israel, think, I think that we see that people our tendency to get the vaccine is uh, negatively correlated with their income so an income is uh, positively correlated with iq so again IQ is like the factor of everything, basically, of, of mm -hmm. almost everything, beside one thing, how good you are. There is no yes, correlation whatsoever between how good and bad. There are two really, really orthogonal uh, uh, things. So, but we can say that if you are smart and bad, you can mm -hmm. cause much, much more harm that if you're Definitely. stupid in bed. So I think Definitely. it's very important to, to state over and over the IQ, your IQ level say nothing about how good you are. N nothing about your morality, nothing yes. about your ethics. You, you are completely right. And, um, and I have language in the book that shies away from, um, that shies away from any, that not only shies away, that, that denies any possible um, connection between IQ and, for example, someone's human rights or, or, or things like that. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, we can all think of, of very smart people who have, who have done great evil in this world. Um, and so I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, but I, I also see... Um, some advantage to smart people being very fluid and where they can apply their skills. Um, what's disappointed me is above average intelligence politicians <laughs> um, thinking that, okay, after listening to an advisor for an hour or two, I can make a decision about epidemiology. It's like, most politicians are probably IQs between about 105 and 120 you're good at getting elected. You're, you're not a physician usually. Okay, Russell, I, I must tell you, it was a fascinating talk. Wow, it was like, again, mind blowing. It's like an amazing uh, uh, journey towards one of the most interesting uh, adventure of the human mind, you know, the measure, do Thank we you. have a ruler that can measure how smart any person mm -hmm. uh, a person is and this also got us into the world of eugenics the holocaust etc so many many things uh, uh, i quote in the book uh, in there's a book uh, iq a good history of a of a bad idea i think 
that mm -hmm. said that uh, of all the ish, Euthanasia. I don't know how you say it. Eth euthanasia, yeah. Euthanasia. We have like th. It's very uh, hard for us Israelis. From all the euthanasia that the German did for the German, uh, they had like they attached an IQ test to say, ah, he is not smart enough. He should be eliminated. So the the IQ again has a very dark history, both in it Canada does. in the U.S. And again, eugenics, uh, mm -hmm. if you know, we didn't speak about eugenics at all, but let me just paraphrase Thomas Sowell that race, that all, uh, all ethnic differences were uh, regarded by the beginning of the 20th century to race and by the end of the 20th century to racism by mm -hmm. basically the same people. So- again, Yeah, and I, I talk about the history and, and i do not sugarcoat it at all i talk about that ugly history in the book i i think that the worst thing people can do when there's ugly events in the history of of their country their scholarly field their family is to hide them um, or to minimize them no i i have a whole chapter that you read that gets it all out there and and makes the connection uh, and then says you know let's talk about how we can set aside you know, ideas don't come packaged up together. Just because Sir Francis Galton started the eugenics movement and he was the first person to say, hey, maybe we can measure intelligence scientifically, doesn't mean that you have to keep them linked together. Um, and just because the eugenic it. movements had a very, very bad reputation doesn't mean that eugenics in general or like positive eugenics is something bad because at least what I say, every time that you bring home a girlfriend and your Jewish mother says, mm, she is not for you, basically she is practicing uh, positive eugenics. So we should be very uh, careful. You're right. And I, I talk about how intelligence history does have this, this dark component where, where People's the human dark rights side, were violated. The dark side of intelligence. Genocide was committed. People were mass murdered. And, and you're aware of that history being being Israeli and Jewish yourself. I I I, I don't have to to recap it. Um, and I hope I hope this world never forgets it though. Um, and so I, I do talk about it and say, look, um, the action component the application is independent of the facts and you can apply facts for good you can apply facts for evil you can apply facts to exploit other people you can apply facts to serve them and help them and i try in the last couple chapters of the book create a framework based in the facts that would lead to a humane world where human rights are are highly valued for every single person. I, I, I want to give you my conclusion regarding the intelligence Please. and the best and, 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 the, uh, and the dark side of it. And I think, and, and I, 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 want to, I want to hear your brutally honest opinion. I think that when uh, God was, was evacuated from the equation, so we cannot say that every man are created equal because they're only the on all men are created equal just before God because men are not equal. When, when Thomas Jefferson wrote it, he knew for sure that not men, not all men are created equal. He was a very, very gifted man. But the notion behind it is that no matter how gifted, how smart, how rich you are, you are all equal before God. And when God was put out of the equation by Nietzsche and Darwin, so we said, by the way, just a second, not all men are created equal. And the eugenic movement was, which was a secular movement said, he is much more equal. He is much, he worth more and he worth less and then et cetera, et cetera. And the liberals now, since they don't believe in God anymore, they must say that all, that, that, that all men are created equal and therefore IQ tests are biased because if all men are created equal, how come the blacks score 15 points below average mm -hmm. or below the white? If we just accept that 
it doesn't matter. It's not equal. You are equal before God, be, be, mm -hmm. uh, before the infinity. And I think that what this is what makes the secular liberals uh, very hard to digest the idea of intelligence. Because if there is no God and they are not equal, so we know what that road led us to in the 20th mm -hmm. century. So I would like to hear again your brutally honest opinion about my conclusion of this uh, endeavor. Um, if I can get personal, because you, you've brought in your personal um, ethics and, and religious beliefs, if, if I may do the same and give you um, the first start off with saying, I, I do agree. Um, Let's finish here. Thank you. <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, but let me tell you why. Um, I, I come from the Judeo Christian tradition, and um, I am a devout Latter day Saint. Um, and just like in the Jewish tradition, yes, the equality is an equal worth. Um, in my church, we talk about every human being being a son or daughter of God. And just like how I love all of my four children, God loves all of us, regardless of who we are, where our situation is. He, I, I like to use the term the infinite. Um, and so when I see people try to equate worth with an IQ score, or with anything else like that, I find that very repulsive because of my um, religious adherence. Um, and so you're right, we are equal before deity. We are of equal worth. And in the book, I use the framework uh, of talking about in the context of human rights, because I, I, it's a scientific book. It should have a secular framework. Um, but what I'm really thinking when I was typing human rights, um, is, is value in the eyes of deity and in the eyes of God. Um, and if you can look at your fellow human beings like that, the idea of exploiting them or as my country did in the past, sterilizing them against their will, let alone genocide becomes incredibly repulsive. That being said, I also agree with you that, um, that just because we are all equal in worth and in receiving love from, from deity, um, that does not mean we are the same. And that um, one of the things that we have to do here on this earth is learn to um, is learn to have compassion for people who are very different from us. Um, and it's not easy. <laughs> um, and so if if you have that perspective, then, the existence of individual or group differences can sometimes be bothersome, but it's just part of what you have, what you are morally responsible to accept and to love. Um, and so that that's my perspective. Being equal in the eyes of deity doesn't make us the same. And thank heavens he made us differently. <laughs> Um, because from a biological perspective, from a moral perspective, from a social perspective, um, there are advantages to differences. Having people who can think differently can benefit all of us. Having people with different interests, different social proclivities, etc., cetera, um, can be very beneficial. And so um, that doesn't mean we ignore differences. That doesn't mean we treat everyone the same. You can make people equal morally, equal ethically, equal legally before the law, 
without making them genetically or socially identical. And that, that's all I got for you. I, I, I think that it, it's like uh, Deb, Deb, Deborah, Deborah Sue, I think that uh, she said regarding uh, cognitive differences between men and, uh, men and women. So it's not sexist to think that men and women are uh, different. No. It's sexist to think that in order to get the, uh, to get the same uh, treatment, women need to be like men. So oh, I yes, I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And, and I have, I try to create in a secular framework, um, a moral and ethical perspective of intelligence saying, you know, we do need to be aware of the limitations that some people have. And if you're smart enough to make it to the end of a nonfiction book about science written by a professor, you're probably smarter than average. Um, and, and I do talk about how, you know, you you need to think about how policies affect people who are very different from you because their IQ is 20 or 30 points lower. And it's not easy. Um, but that's part of what we're put on the earth for is to, to learn how to feel compassion and learn how to care for people who are unlike us. And I think that this will be a great finish and a great moral finish. And uh, uh, you, know, you know how to add this, uh, how to take this uh, statistics and such a cold thing and say, listen, but at the end, eventually this research affects many, many people. And, mm -hmm. and you need, or you, we said that morality and IQ has nothing in common, but in a more profound way, they should have anything in common because we need to adapt, we need to harness morality in order to address those very, very important and mm -hmm. delicate and inflammatory questions. So Dr. Russell Warren, Utah University, Utah Valley University, yes? Yes. It, uh, uh, the author of in the know, debunking 35 myths regarding user uh, uh, human intelligence. This was a lovely, lovely, lovely talk. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It's um, you kept me on my toes, and that's what the best interviewers do. And so um, I'm glad you, you kept me awake and alert. <laughs> I must tell you, I, I wanted to do like uh, like IQ talks with many people. I had Gary Jones on the show, and now okay. you, Richard Heyer, and Richard Lin is going to be here. And uh, now, when where, where Stefan Molinuk was banned from YouTube, I'm uh, a little bit afraid. I <laughs> I must tell you, it's it's like we'll see. Uh, I hope we'll see. Um, hopefully. I mean, and, and I had no idea you were going to go there with a with a moral framework. I had no idea I was going to, to talk Neither about do my moral I. Neither do I. But you know, the, the, that's it, where the conversation went yes. great. And I, I hope that people can see that um, there can be a very compassionate science. And so, you know, I I, I understand that fear of of being censored it's something i live with regularly um but my hope is that um is that moments like the one we had i think crept up on both of us yes definitely um will show that there's there's nothing to fear as long as we ensure that there's a strong moral compass in these and strong moral component to these conversations. Definitely, definitely. So. Dr. Russell Warren, in the know, thank you so much for coming. You're welcome, thanks.